steroids to suppress the inflammation in the kidney, and then you give cyclophosphamide to try and suppress further antibody formation. So this was actually developed in about 1975, and we're doing much the same now. Just monitor the drugs and they've changed. Of course, for anti-GDM disease, you don't need to treat very long. You just need to treat for a few weeks, and then you can stop the treatment, hopefully, and the patient, this particular patient, will cover function and that's the stuff. We do have a new drug that we're developing for anti-GBM disease, and those of you interested in the transplant literature will have seen data on this drug. So this is a streptococcal protein which cleaves IgG. And within minutes of infusing this protein, the IgG level in the blood goes down to zero. So it takes your IgG immediately to zero. So it has been used to desensitize patients prior to renal transplantation. We're using it in anti-GBM disease. This just shows you what happens to the IgG levels. They plummet right down. And then after a week or two, they start coming back again. And the concept with anti-GBM disease is you want rapid action. So this is much more rapid than plasma exchange or immune absorption. So just watch this space. There will be some data possibly presented at the European meeting next year. We've treated about 11 patients at the moment. In terms of other drug therapy, there have been some tweaks. And we tend to use IV cyclophosphamide because we deliver lower doses. We no longer have problems with ovarian toxicity with the amount we give. But rituximab is now uh, regarded as being at least equivalent to cyclophosphamide for ankle vasculitis. It is licensed, uh, but, but important to remember that there's no high quality data in severe RPGM. The rituximab data is in mild renal disease or no reason or patients without renal disease. And so there's a lot of interest about combining or worry that it's not strong enough and about combining with cyclophosphate. I'm going to say a word about methylphenolate. As far as steroids are concerned, things really haven't changed. We give IV steroid, and then we give oral steroid. But I'll show you a little bit of steroid data in a minute. Rituximab is remarkably effective. So this is data on 180 patients enrolled in a trial. They all had relapsing disease. So this is slightly tougher to treat GPA, MPA. And you can see very high remission rate. This is over 90%. And in fact, out of the 180, 190 odd patients, only about seven had an efficacy failure. The others failed for, for other reasons. So rituximab is remarkably effective. We don't necessarily use it routinely for new patients. And for our PGM, certainly the older patients, we still will use cyclophosphamide. For the younger patient where there's pressure on preserving fertility, then uh, we would use rituximab. This trial was reported last year, and it's a head-to-head -head of mycophenolate to intravenous cyclophosphamide for ankylvasculitis, the majority of whom had renal disease that excluded the most severe GFR less than 15. And it showed not a lot of difference at six months, roughly similar response rates. But when we continued the trial and looked at relapse, we saw a great excess of relapses in the PR3 group treated with MMF. So we sort of gone a bit cold on using mycophenolate for PR3, but for NPO anchor vasculitis, just as in lupus nephritis, I think it's an option. Uh, I think it's an option. And there have been another couple of smaller randomized trials in NPO anchor vasculitis. This is some uh, non-randomized data that is trying to get patients off steroids rapidly. And over the years, we've got to the conclusion, which maybe you got to a long time ago, that steroids are the main drivers of problems. Steroids are the main drivers of infection, and infection is the main uh, serious adverse event these patients suffer from. Uh, this regimen combines rituximab two times one gram with relatively low dose cyclophosphamide, six 500 milligram pulses. Uh, and at least in a small number of centers in this observational study, results are great. Now we're wondering about doing a bigger trial. And we use this sort of cocktail for the younger patient with severe RPGM because it's cyclophosphamide sparing. We're giving the cyclophosphamide initially because we do think that's doing something important in the kidney. The rituximab comes in after a few weeks, and then you can stop the cyclophosphamide. So cyclophosphamide's there. What about plasma exchange? Well, 
for anti-GBM disease, we're all going to carry on using it. If we're not dealing with the, you know, some other uh, agent to rapidly remove antibody. But what about ankyovasculitis? We've just completed a big study, which was about one of the first global studies of vasculitis, looking at price more exchange. And this was RPGN patients. So it was patients with GFR less than 50. The average serum correctment coming in is about 320. So there was severe renal disease. The kick up here, this is proportion of patients who are either dying or developing end-stage renal disease. This is the kick up here is the definition of end-stage renal disease, 12 weeks of dialysis. And although there was a trend early on to a benefit with the plasma, in the plasma exchange group, with follow-up, that was completely lost. And we've seen no, for the group as a whole, we've seen no sustained benefit of plasma exchange. Now, we're doing sub-analyses of this trial, and it contradicts previous trials. Uh, and we think there may be a role in some of the more severe patients. Uh, but the take-home point from this is plasma exchange may buy you a few months off dialysis, but it catches up with you, I think. So we're not going to recommend routine use of plasma exchange. Another aspect of this particular trial was actually to test steroids. And as you know, there are almost no trials with new different steroid doses. And we compared a sort of standard steroid dose, one big per kilo, coming down quite slowly over six months, to what we call the rapidly reducing regimen, where we reduce by half almost immediately, such that we get about half the exposure to steroids. So this is a non-inferiority. We were trying to show that the lower dose regimen was as good at saving lives and kidneys, and we showed that. So very similar curve to before. Really no difference. So the non-inferiority hypothesis was accepted. But more importantly, there were fewer serious infections with the reduced steroid dose. So we now actually have a standardized steroid regimen which we can recommend that you use which is give your one milligram per kilogram a day for a week, but then drop rapidly uh, down. Another question in treating these patients is how long should you treat for? And ankyovasculitis is a relapsing disorder. Uh, and this was a, a, a study reported a couple of years ago by the European group, and it simply showed that if you gave two years of azathioprine steroid, you saw more relapses when the drugs, uh, this, this, the trial started about two years out, uh, as opposed to continuing the azathioprine steroids. And also, there was a statistic, statistical difference in end-stage renal disease. So this is a bit of a problem, because we don't like putting patients on azathioprine and prednisolone forever. We have an alternative, uh, and rituximab is now validated as a maintenance agent. So it was originally introduced as a reduction agent, and last year, at least in the US, and in Europe, the license has been extended as a maintenance agent. It's based on this trial, where six monthly doses of rituximab were compared to azathioprine, and there was complete, clear superiority. It's another bigger trial that's ongoing at the moment, which I think will show the same thing. Rituximab is coming down in price, and this trial used 500 milligram infusion, so, uh, whereas previous studies have used a gram, so, so it's becoming more. What other drugs are coming up? Well, I mentioned in the, in the background that ankyovasculitis was a coarsely immune disorder, and we have had thought that complement was not particularly important, and of course we were completely wrong. And it turns out that complement is very important. And in that animal model I showed you, if you remove complement, they don't get the vasculitis. Uh, and it all seems to be C5A. And basically, whenever you're talking about neutrophils, you have to remember that C5A is described as an a, a, a anaphylotoxin, as, as, as a drug that activates one of the strongest activators and chemoattractants of neutrophils. So C5A is targeted by eculizumab, but eculizumab targets both products of C5, both C5B, and that's why you get the, the worries about some meningitis. Uh, because you're targeting the terminal attack complex. Um, but there are now a couple of drugs that have been developed that just target C5A, and I've been working with a company that's developing this drug, Abacapan, which is an oral specific C5A receptor inhibitor. And we did a phase two trial, and in this trial we replaced steroids with Abacapan, or we had an intermediate group with a low-dose steroid and Abacapan. 
and all the graphs have the same color code. Essentially, the gray line is the high-dose steroids, the red line is zero steroids for the vacapan, and the blue line is low-dose steroids for the vacapan. Don't read too much to the GFR because it's difference at baseline, but this was what surprised us, and this was the fall in proteinuria. Now, with ankyovasculitis, typically you don't see very rapid falls in proteinuria. It comes down over a few months, and this is what we saw in the control group. But the avacapan group, groups dropped quickly. This was mirrored by reductions in NCP1 and reductions in hematuria. So this holds the promise of a complete alternative to steroid for ankyovasculitis. Um, uh, the phase three trial, which is ongoing, is going to report in the next couple of months. So this will be at the meetings next year. What about guidelines? Well, the European guidelines on ankyovasculitis were updated a couple of years ago, three years ago, in fact, 2016. Uh, and some of what I said are all included in those guidelines. KDIGO, uh, as was referred to before the lunch break, the glomerular practice guidelines are being updated right now, or have been pretty well updated. And I think yeah, I'd be very critical of KDIGO because I don't particularly like their methodology for glomerular disease, where there's so little high quality evidence. Uh, but I think the uh, guidelines for glomerular arthritis, including ankylovasculitis, are, are going to be better than they were in 2012. I hope I'm not upsetting KDIGO advocates in the audience, I probably am. So key messages, RPGN is a potentially reversible cause of ESRD. Ankyovasculitis is the major subgroup. We classify them by serology and histology. Always remember the secondary causes. In terms of management, we now have established regimens and guidelines. The role of rituximab is expanding. And it's one of the surprising, surprising things to me that rituximab has been around since 1996 and nobody else has put an anti-CD20 into autoimmunity. You know, it's really had a clear run, but, but there are lots of anti-CD20s in cancer, uh, but it's still the only one we have in autoimmunity. I said a little bit about steroid dosing. The role of plasma exchange is diminishing, uh, and I think complement inhibition is something to look out for in the future. Thank you very much.